Soon after he opened his shop, the first man came in and said, I want to shave. The barber said, sure, just sit in the seat and I'll be with you in a moment. The barber went into the back room and he prayed a quick, desperate prayer saying, God, the first customer came in and I'm going to witness to him. Give me wisdom to know just how to say the right thing to him. Amen. Then the barber came out with his razor knife in one hand, a Bible in the other, and he said, Good morning, sir. I have a question for you. Are you prepared to die? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I bet he passed out. <laughs> uh, don't recommend that method. Uh, <laughs> that uh, probably wouldn't be wise. All right, we're going to get into our Bibles. Hopefully you have a Bible there. And let's go ahead and begin by uh, looking at Romans chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Warm, John, <laughs> Acts. It's over there someplace. To the right, from Matthew, Romans chapter 8. If you have the Bible loaned out in the pew, it's a Schofield Bible, and the page number will be the same as mine, and I will call out page numbers to help if it does, but you're getting there faster than I am, I'm afraid. Romans chapter 8, page 1202, we're going to look at verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded. Here we find Paul the Apostle says, I am persuaded. And if you were to look up the word persuaded from the original language, from the Greek, it means thoroughly convinced. Thoroughly convinced. I am thoroughly convinced, persuaded, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature or creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a great eternal security verse because it points out nothing can ever undo what happens when a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. <clears throat> Once you trust Christ, you become born again and it's irreversible. You cannot become unborn, physically or spiritually. How do you become unborn? Has anybody here tried? I want to become unborn. You, you can't do it. And uh, not only physically, but also spiritually. Once you become born again into the family of God, you cannot reverse it. It's forever. Isn't that great? And here, notice he says, I am thoroughly convinced that neither death Death won't separate you from the Lord. In fact, the Bible says, and we covered it last week, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So it brings you to be in the Lord's presence. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. If you were to die as a Christian right now, you would be absent from the body, immediately present with the Lord in heaven. Nor life, nothing in your life could ever cause you to be separated or lose your salvation. Nor angels, God's angels or Satan's angels, or the devil himself cannot rob you of your salvation. So the devil would like to rob you of your assurance, and I think he does that often of people where they lose the assurance of their salvation, but he can't rob you of your salvation. You have it forever and ever and ever. Nor principalities, nor powers, any authorities, Bodies of government or religious bodies cannot take away your salvation. But there are many churches that can at least claim that they can revoke your salvation. The Roman Catholic Church claims that they can excommunicate you and you would lose your salvation if you were cast out of the church. Isn't that amazing? Well, the church might cast you out, but the Lord will never cast you out. John 6.37, Jesus says, Him that cometh to me... I will in no wise cast out. No such thing as excommunication in, in the family of God. Once you become saved, you'll never be cast out. I know there are some people right here that have told me they've been cast out of the Roman Catholic Church. 
They're excommunicated and denied the Mass and all those things. I have several ones shaking their heads right near me here. And, uh, and obviously a scary thing for those people who think that their salvation is dependent upon that church. But our salvation is not dependent upon the church, it's dependent upon Jesus. And it was He that uh, died for us and paid our sin debt in full. And it was He that made the promise in John 6.37, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Isn't that wonderful to know you can go to sleep at night and know that you will awake in heaven should you die during the night. As a little boy, I was taught to pray the prayer before I would go to sleep. Now I lay my... Now, well, how's it go now? I don't know. Okay, now I lay myself down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul would take. And you know that prayer caused more fear than comfort because it talked about... Uh, I pray the Lord would take my soul if I should die before I wake, and I would uh, be a little bit nervous after I prayed that prayer. I pray He will take my soul. But of course at that time I was not saved, and I didn't know anything like what I know now. But you can go to sleep at night and know that should you die before you wake, definitely you'd be absent from the body, present with the Lord. You're secure and saved forever. That's got to be good news. That when uh, you're awake or whether you're asleep, you're a child of God and nothing can undo that. It says here, nor things present. Nothing in your life at this present moment can cause you to lose your salvation. It says here, nor things to come. There's nothing in your future that could cause you to be lost. But yet many churches teach that if in your future you stray or you do this or do that, then you would lose your salvation and be separated separated from the Lord. Not true. Not true. Nothing in your future. Things to come. Verse 39, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This salvation that you and I have is eternal. And that's got to be the best news you've ever heard. It is eternal life. And you know, people are apparently looking for it, but looking in all the wrong places. Look at how much is spent on uh, health and vitamins and life extension, and people are just, uh, you know, drinking these potions and taking these vitamin pills, and, and uh, some people, I don't know, they just take handfuls of these things. You ever seen them? It's time to take my pills. And down they go, hoping to be a little healthier, to stay alive a little bit longer, to have a better quality of life here, when we all know that this life will come to an end, but if you're a believer, you have the best life extension plan, the best uh, plan in all the universe, it's called eternal life, and God offers it free to all that trust the Lord. Isn't that great? We're going to have brand new bodies that will not have any problems when we get to heaven, and it's forever and ever and ever. Nothing can separate you or me. And this is a great verse, isn't it? I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, or it should read creation, shall be able to separate us from the Lord, love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As a believer, you can put that in the first person and say, nothing shall separate me. Nothing's going to separate me. And uh, obviously that's true for all of us as believers. So we can get excited about that. I know. And how wonderful it was. I really saw this the night that I got saved. I was 18. And I knew from that moment on I was going to heaven. And uh, I knew that if I didn't, God was a liar. The Bible was not true. Might as well light a match and walk away. But this book is true. It is God's word. And we can trust that God will not lie. He will not trick us. He will not mislead us. But what he has said here will actually come to pass. The Bible claims that it is truth, and the Bible says it will be around forever. Uh, and what promises God has made will never, ever be broken. Let's turn now to chapter 12 of Romans. Chapter 12 of Romans. If you read the book of Romans, and we're giving a quick little survey here, Chapters 1 through 8 talk about this wonderful salvation that we have. 
that's not based upon works, but it's based upon the finished work of Christ. And when we trust Him, we become saved. And those first eight chapters make that very, very clear. And we conclude the eighth chapter with those great words of assurance that nothing can ever undo the salvation that you have received in Christ. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are what we call parenthetical, and they just kind of step back and talk about God's overall plan for the Jews, and for the Gentiles, and the body of Christ. And now chapter 12, verse 1, drops right back into where we were at the end of chapter 8. So you can just disregard 9, 10, and 11 as far as the theme, and in chapter 12 now we jump back into that theme. In verse 1 of chapter 12 it says, I beseech. That word means to beg or to plead or to uh, insist or urge. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. And notice here it says, therefore. Uh, the therefore takes us back to what we read in the first eight chapters. Because of what God has promised, that our salvation is a gift purchased by Christ, received free when we trust Jesus as Savior, that we can never be separated or it cannot be undone, we cannot become unborn once we become born again in His family. It says, I plead with you, therefore, based upon what you have already learned in the book of Romans, He's writing here to believers, he calls them brethren, by the mercies of God. What that means is, is based upon the mercy that God has had upon you and upon me as a believer, the fact that we're saved eternally and can never be lost, he urges us now to make a second decision to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So God wants us now to make a second decision we first trust Him as our Savior and become saved, and that's eternal. The second decision now is to serve Him, to become a servant, uh, one who would live for the Lord. And notice here, we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, we are to live our lives in sacrifice to Him, who gave His life for us so that we might be saved. And that means you say, Lord, I'm going to spend my life for you and for your glory and not for my own. So whatever goals, whatever values that you had, you set them aside and say, Lord, I want you to be first in my life. And I want to serve you all the days of my life. And I'm going to spend my life as a living sacrifice. This is interesting because in the Old Testament we had sacrifices that were offered and they would uh, be put up on the altar and, and slain, the blood would be shed. But here it talks about us being a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice is it can crawl off the altar. Uh, you can change your mind. And so here he's asking us to be a living sacrifice all of our life, that you don't change your mind, you make a one-time lifelong decision where you say, Lord, I want to live for you, based upon the mercy that you've had upon me. I was deserving of going to hell. I should have gone to hell, but you came because you loved me, and you died on the cross and paid my sin debt in full, and if I would trust you, I'd be given eternal life. And now, in return, I want to live for you because of what you have done for me. And so here we are to all become living sacrifices that you would live every day, throughout your life for His glory. Whatever you might do as a vocation, that you would really have the Lord first in your life, that you would want to live to please Him. Notice it says, holy, acceptable unto God. The last phrase says, which is what? Your reasonable service. In other words, it's only reasonable in view of what Christ has done for us that we would want to live for Him since He died for us. Hold your place here. We're going to go back to the chapter where we were last week. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, what a wonderful chapter this is. And throughout the chapter, we're reminded of what Christ has done for us. You might remember verse 21. We asked you to read it out loud, I believe, twice last week. Let's go ahead and read it out loud again. 2 Corinthians 5, page 1233. We're going to read verse 21. 
For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is a great verse. And what it's telling us here is what happened at the cross. That God took your sin and my sin and laid it upon Jesus Christ, Christ who was sinless, who knew no sin, that we in the exchange might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the substitutionary payment. Jesus took our place. He took our sin and the punishment due our sin upon himself. And he died to pay for all that we've ever done wrong, past, present, and future. So that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When God looks down upon the believer, he sees you forgiven. He sees you righteous in God's sight. And you have become a child of God. And it's irreversible, as we just saw. And the wonderful assurance that we have, like in verse 8, it says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We know that whenever death should come, that that is our fate. I'll be immediately in the presence of the Lord. Absolutely incredible thought, isn't it? And uh, you don't need uh, a rocket or a spaceship. You're going to be instantly transported from here into the very presence of God in heaven at the moment of death. We found last week in verse 9, it says, Wherefore we what? We labor. As a believer, because of God and what he's done for us, we choose to labor. Why? That whether we're present or absent from the Lord, we may be accepted of him. That is, to have his approval and that has to do with rewards. God wants to reward the believer. He wants every one of us to serve him. And he's asking us here in Romans 12 to make that choice to become living sacrifices. Now, let's go over to verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Here it goes through a reasoning process. When Jesus Christ died for all, he died for all because all were spiritually dead. All needed eternal life that only he could give based upon his death in our place. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge if one died for all, that's Jesus. He died for every man, woman, and child that would ever live. Then we're all dead. They were all spiritually dead. All in need of the salvation that he would provide for us. Verse 15, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. So now you learn that God intended that we would now live for him, for the one who died for us so that we might live. Verse 15 again, that he died for all, he died for every man, woman, and child that would ever live. This obviously is not the doctrine of limited atonement, which Calvinists teach that he only died for the ones that he chose in advance to be saved. But notice he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but what or who or whom should we live for? But unto him that uh, died for them and rose again. So we as believers should reason that out. And as a new believer, I remember thinking, wow, if Jesus was willing to die for me, the least I could do is tell other people about him. Would that be too hard? And you know, we ought to get excited about telling him the good news uh, that we have eternal life. I almost didn't know what happened the other day on the radio. This guy from Richmond, Virginia starts screaming. But he was screaming for joy and he just uh, couldn't, couldn't contain himself. And I said, you must be really excited. And he said, I am. And he says he's so excited to be saved and know that he's saved. And he just couldn't help but, but shout it out. And uh, I almost wondered if I should pull the button or the slide or cut him off the air because it got a little bit uh, extreme, I thought. And probably our listeners that heard that program would think so too. But he was excited. And he was very excited about what the Lord had done for him. And this is, of course, the choices that we are to make here as believers. Now I want to go over to the book of Revelation to chapter 3. And here we have a very interesting passage. Every believer is to make the choice to serve the Lord. Every believer should decide to live for Christ. 
and to be a witness and tell others about Christ. And uh, the question always arises, and it did for me and I'm sure it does for you too, how could God use me? And uh, what impact could I have? And how could uh, uh, this really come to pass? Well, I think this particular chapter is one of encouragement because here it talks about God delights in using weak things and weak persons to accomplish His glory. So you might feel like, boy, I don't think I could be much of an influence for Christ. I don't think I could be a great servant for Christ. When uh, God indeed wants to use you in such a way that He would get the glory because people would recognize that what's happening here is He is working in and through you to proclaim the gospel to others. That's what I like about what's happening right here at Calvary. You know, people come here as visitors and they say, I can't believe it. This church has a worldwide ministry that we're touching lives all across the country. And uh, obviously they don't see the financial resources. They don't see the manpower and woman power resources. And they say, well, how can this be? And the only conclusion you come to is it has to be God. Because God has to be doing that. Because obviously, how could we ever pull this off? I tell people, we're the little church with the big bark. And it's heard around the world today. That's amazing. And we know, and the evidence is here. These people here uh, are here from Michigan. who listen every day. A whole family. And we hear it all the time. And people coming by now from different places that are hearing the word go forth out of here. Well, verse 7 talks about the church at Philadelphia. That was a real church that did exist when John wrote this book at the end of the first century. But also, prophetically, it pictures a church age and church history. But also, it is a picture of individual Christians who make up the church, the body of Christ. And notice what it says here. To the angel, and that word angel means messenger, it's talking, I believe, about the pastor of that church who would deliver the message to the congregation as God's representative, his, uh, his uh, spokesperson. And so the word angel here is applied to men and not angels as we traditionally think about angels. So to the pastor of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Who is that? Jesus Christ. And so Christ here has a message for that church at Philadelphia in Asia Minor. And by the way, the church uh, name obviously was picked up by people in this country, the early Christians, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is named after this one right here. In fact, many cities in America have biblical names because they were believers and the Bible meant something in those days which apparently the Bible now is being discarded or or uh, not regarded or pushed out of our society but uh, there are many many cities across America that have biblical names because the people wanted that association and this is of course uh, this uh, wonderful uh, city of Philadelphia where a church was established uh, that uh, people our early people here in America decided that we want to name our city after this city of Philadelphia. And notice he says in verse 8, I know thy works, which is true of everything that we do. Christ knows everything we do, everything we think. And he says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And it says here, And no man can what? Shut it. Why? Because uh, you're brilliant because of your uh, uh, studies and your intellect and because of your incredible gifts that God has given to you and so on. It doesn't say any of that. Why was this church so used of God and why was it that God opened a door that nobody could shut? For thou hast what? A little strength. Isn't that a surprise answer? A little strength. So let me just tell you, if you have a little strength, you can be mightily used of God 
because God wants to use people of little strength. Isn't that amazing? So this is the ones he uses. And usually the one was with all the fanfare don't really get used at all. And they don't really have the impact uh, as God would have us to have impact. For thou hast a little strength. But notice, what were the two positive qualities here that they did have? You've kept my word. Kept my word. And that is so important. And you might want to mark that down. You have to keep the word of God. You have to believe the Bible and put it into practice. And secondly, you have not denied my name. Two simple things. If you would keep the word of God and not deny the name of Christ. And look at how many people today, in subtle ways, deny the name of Christ. A lot of times when you ask somebody, are you a Christian, they'll say, I'm a Baptist. Nothing wrong with being a Baptist, but where's the name of Jesus here? Or are you a Christian? I'm a Methodist. Or are you a Christian? Well, I'm a Lutheran. What happened to the name of Jesus? I caused great consternation when I went into the hospital and I had to fill in the blank, what are you? And I said, a Bible-believing, saved, you know, going to heaven Christian who's trusted Jesus Christ. Well, they said that didn't match the little pre-designated boxes that they had. And I got re-asked about this question. You know, they want to box you in and put you in a little pigeonhole. And if you want to cause great problems when you get admitted, uh, put down that you're a, a Bible-believing, born-again, uh, blood-washed <laughs> believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will cause all kinds of problems. What in the world are you? Come on now. Are you Protestant or, or whatever? And I had a guy on the phone the other day ask me in some kind of a little survey, are you a Protestant or a Catholic or a Jew or whatever? And I, was, and I gave him the same answer, and he said, well, wait a minute, that's not on my paper here. He didn't know how to fill that out. But in any case, we need to just say what we are. We're, we've trusted Jesus as our Savior. Why do we give these other answers which avoid uh, the cross or Jesus Christ? And, of course, we should... Uh, be willing to let people know that we are believers. And as a result, the Lord opened a door. The Bible says that no man could shut. And that's doors of opportunity to serve Him and become strong for Him. I want you to go over to Mark's Gospel for just a moment. We'll come back to Revelation if you didn't lose your place already. But Mark's Gospel, let's turn over there, and we'll see here it talks about the converse of this. This is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, and this will be on page 1,000, and it should be 1,056. Jesus here, in verse 34 of Mark, chapter 8, page 1056, when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also. He said unto them, Whosoever will come after me. This is that second decision that Romans 12.1 is talking about. This is the decision where you choose to serve the Lord and be a living sacrifice, to choose to be a witness for Christ. Whosoever will come after me. And if you're marking it, you might want to mark come after, because to be saved, we simply come to Christ. He's done all the work for salvation. We simply come to Him, receive the gift of eternal life at the moment we trust Him as our Savior. But the second decision involves following Christ, which is explained here in this phrase here, to come after Christ. Let Him deny Himself. In other words, you are obviously a living sacrifice. You're no longer going to follow your desires, but rather the desires that the, the Lord has implanted in you from His Word. And take up His cross, and notice it says follow. We follow Christ not to be saved, but we follow Christ as disciples, as our second decision. Then it says in verse 35, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. <clears throat> now what does that really mean? It's really saying here, Whosoever will save his life. In other words, if you choose 
to save it for yourself or spend it for yourself or use it for yourself, you will, in a sense, lose your life when you stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ because you will have no rewards. There will be nothing that God would say, you're accepted or approved of me for reward, and you'll lose out. But it says here, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall what? Save it. So here it's talking about if you, the better word in there probably is to spend. If you're willing to spend your life for Christ's sake and for the gospels, then the, that person who does that will have saved their life in the sense that it'll be worth eternal rewards. So you have to say, what do you want? And a lot of people are living for self and for the things of this world and are not living for the things which are eternal. And so it says here, if you are going to spend your life for yourself, you will have lost it because your investment would be zero. When you get to heaven, you'll have no reward. But if you'll spend your life for my sake in the Gospels, you will have saved your life in that it would have counted and the rewards you would get would be great. Then it says in verse 36, For what shall it profit a man? The word profit should tip you off. This is talking about rewards. Salvation is never spoken of as profit. It is obviously everywhere you see it, a gift already purchased by Christ. But profit has to do with rewards. Things that you earn by what you do here for God in this life. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. The word loser probably better be read forfeit. Forfeit his soul or forfeit his, the word soul really means life. In other words, if you don't live for Christ, you would have forfeited all you could have had for Christ by living for him, and you would have lose that when you get to heaven. Many evangelists, though, use this in a wrong way, and they obviously are works-based in their salvation and say what if you gained the whole world and lost your soul like you have to serve the Lord to, to be saved and it's not really saying that but it's talking about your life being saved in the sense that it will count for rewards in eternity or what are in view here what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and then forfeit his life as it will have no reward or no meaning in heaven if you don't live for the Lord here so he's giving us uh, this whole uh, uh, picture of how we need to spend our life here to be rewarded there. And if we spend our life here for ourselves, then we won't have rewards there in heaven. Verse 38, I want you to get ready. Now we're going to look at the same things that were in Revelation chapter 3, but here the negative side. Whosoever therefore shall be what? Ashamed of me. This is talking about believers now. These are people confronted with the decision to be disciples or servants of Christ. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation uh, of him shall also the Son of Man be ashamed when he returns. He's talking about two things. What did we learn over there in Revelation? He said, they kept my word. Look at what it says here. Notice, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of my words, or my word. So instead of being ashamed of the word of God, we need to be keeping the word of God and embracing it. Then notice, it said in Revelation, you didn't deny my name. Notice here, this person is ashamed to mention the name of Jesus Christ. And as a result, Christ says, I'm going to be ashamed of you. So this is a nice picture of the secret of the Christian life. Keep the Word of God and don't be ashamed to tell people you're a Christian that you're a believer and witness for Jesus Christ. If you don't, if you're ashamed of Christ and you're ashamed of His Word and ashamed of His name and you don't mention His name, then He's going to be ashamed of you when you stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ. It's pretty plain and I can show many examples of these two things being the major factor that really separates those who are going to be rewarded from those who are not going to be rewarded. And those in Revelation were obviously uh, spoken of in a special way that he says, you have a little strength, but I've opened a door for you that nobody can shut. Nobody can shut it. 
And obviously, God is glorified and he gets the credit because people realize, wow, how could you accomplish what you did? And you obviously couldn't have. It was the Lord who was strong on your behalf as a believer. And so we find that it's oftentimes people with little strength, maybe little ability, no talents necessarily, but are willing to keep the word of God and not shut their mouth when it comes to talking about Christ. And Christ will be strong on their behalf and God will give them victory. I want you to go back to the book of Daniel and we'll look at a man here that uh, was in this category. Here's a man who is carried away captive uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar and his armies into Iraq, into Babylon, into captivity. He obviously is at the mercy of his uh, enemies, those who now had control over his life, and they basically were telling him uh, what he could and could not do. We find here in chapter 1, Daniel was told what he could eat and what he could not eat. He had been told to eat only the food and things that were offered at the king's table. And Daniel knew that many of those things were offered to false gods, and uh, he refused to do that. So we find here that Daniel was a man who made a purposeful decision, like we were talking about in Romans 12, 1 and 2, to make your life a living sacrifice. Daniel said in Daniel 1, 8, page 898, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not, might not defile him. So here he said, I am not going to defile myself with the false religious systems of uh, Babylon. And uh, uh, he made that request known to the man over him in charge that he didn't want to do that. And he made a decision from the very get-go in his life. Now we find as a result, look at what God does here. Now God had brought Daniel in the favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. So here was Daniel basically under the control of the king and his orders and could be killed if he did not carry them out. But he's saying, I'm purposing not to follow what man wants me to do, but I want to do what God wants me to do. And God brought him into tender favor. And you notice here, he uh, gives Daniel a trial period. Daniel said to Melzar in verse 11, uh, verse 12, prove or test your servants, I beseech you, 10 days. That was Daniel and his three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it says here, let them give us pulse to eat, which was like a lentil soup, and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So they consented in this matter, and he proved him for just ten days. At the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared to be fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and wine that they should drink, and gave them pulse, or this lentil soup. And as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the days that the king had said that he should bring them in, they brought in the different ones before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king, verse 19, communed with them, and among them also was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore they stood before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Isn't that amazing? God blessed these four men for their dedication. And here they stand out and rise to the top uh, as the cream rises to the top. They became the ones that God blessed. 
I'm going to go to one more passage, and I think you'll see something fascinating here. Turn, if you will, to Second Chronicles, and this is going to come right after First Chronicles. I knew that you'd appreciate that help. Chapter 16, I believe it is. This is page 504, if you have the right kind of Bible. It says in verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, Second Chronicles 16, verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. So God is looking for people he can use. What are the qualifications? Be dumb, weak, inadequate, lacking in every area. It says here, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself what? Strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect or mature toward Him. God is looking for those that He can be strong in their lives and use them in a mighty way beyond what they could accomplish, beyond what they could do. And throughout the Bible, that has always been the plan. And so, it says in Corinthians, not the mighty, not the wise, uh, not the noble, but it says that the base and the things that are weak, God uses to demonstrate His power in individual lives. And so I believe that if you say, well, I don't know how I could be of any service to the Lord. I don't feel like I have any real talents to contribute. I don't feel like I have a whole lot of strength. I don't feel like I have a whole lot of ability. Sign up right now. Uh, you're a good candidate because God isn't looking for those things. That's not what He's looking for. He's looking for somebody whose heart is sincere toward the Lord and He says, I'm going to be strong on your behalf. And when people see the accomplishments, they're going to give God the glory because that's really what it's all about. Here's the last passage where this will quit. First Corinthians chapter 1. Hopefully it all kinds of comes together now as we've been kind of putting it together for you. But in Corinthians chapter 1, page 1212, verse 26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men, page 1212, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, this is not the calling or the invitation of God for you to be saved. This is talking to believers who are saved. And now he's inviting you to be his servant. To live for him. And he says, you'll notice that not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty are called. Verse 27. What is God looking for? God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Verse 28, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And here's the reason why, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence. God said, I want to get the glory and I want to use people who are weak, who are not mighty, and are not noble, just plain Janes and plain Johns that would just be willing to be sincere to live for me. And I will do things that will obviously reflect that I'm the one who did it. And it was not your strength, it was not your power, it was not your wisdom, it was the fact that you trusted in me, that God does great things. And he opens doors that nobody can shut. 
and shuts doors that man, no man can open. And it's basically, his eyes are roaming right now. He's looking all over the world for an individual here, an individual there. Somebody would just say, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to do my best. And I'll keep your word, and I won't deny your name. And if you do that, God says, I'm going to bless you. And, uh, and obviously, uh, we live with a shortage of those kinds of people, don't we? It seems like there aren't many who would just do that. And I guarantee it, if you do that, God will use you in a mighty way. I know Jim Sizemore is here, and he remembers a lady that they like very much, and I did too. Her name was Felicity. She didn't have any real wealth to speak of. She didn't have a whole lot of talents that I knew of. And uh, she just uh, was a very simple person with a big heart and loved the Lord. And she just talked to everybody about Jesus. And God used her to win so many people to Christ, I believe, and influence so many lives. You couldn't get near her when she didn't say something about Jesus Christ. And she loved something that she learned here, and that is that when we get to heaven, we're going to have it for older, younger bodies. And she would always say, did you know that when we get to heaven, we're going to be 33 years young? That was her favorite opening line. And she would, you couldn't get near her without her telling you that. Faithful, wanting to come to church. When she got older, she, her driving skills decreased. She came up here one night, missed the driveway, and went into that ditch out there. We looked out there, and the car was still running, the lights were on, but she was here in church. <laughs> Somebody went out, turned the lights off, and turned the key off, and we helped her get it out of the ditch after church. But she didn't want to miss church, and she was just a faithful little witness for Christ. Wow! I believe her rewards will exceed so many that have so much more to offer the way the world would see it than she did. But she was obviously greatly used of God. And I think she left a tremendous mark in her neighborhood and uh, wherever she went in the grocery store. I mean, she talked to anybody, anywhere, everywhere, and, and didn't deny the Lord and loved the Lord and was faithful in what she was able to do. What a blessing she was. Well, God wants to use all of you and use all of us here at Calvary to accomplish a lot. And uh, if you're looking at numbers, uh, then you haven't been reading your Bible. God used how many disciples to turn the world upside down? Twelve. That's it. Twelve men turned the world upside down. God says, look, I don't need a, a lot of people to do my job. I just need some faithful ones who will carry it out. And so it's not how many, not how much money you have, it's not how much strength you have, how much wisdom you have. It's are you going to take what God has given you and use it for Him. And if you do, God will bless it and use it. And people will say, and I know people come in here and they gasp and they say, I thought this was a mega church. Thousands of people, huge staffs carrying out everything. And we're a handful of people uh, working to get this message out. And God has allowed us a great door of opportunity to proclaim the gospel uh, really all over the country and all over the world. And it's exciting. And I had a pastor call me yesterday. He said, I've only been a pastor a little over a year. He says, but I want to be just like you. He says, I'm, I'm aspiring to be able to do what you do and, and being able to turn to the Bible and answer people's questions and and minister to people as you've ministered to me. And uh, that's exciting because we have a lot of pastors that are listening and that we're influencing. And I thought, well, how humbling that is. And I said, uh, wow, I just uh, hope you just uh, emulate my good points and not everything. But uh, we're all uh, humans. And obviously uh, God wants to use us in a mighty way. Let's bow in prayer and we'll quit. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, my friend, where would you go if you were to die? And obviously we're all going to die. And if you didn't know whether you'd go to heaven or not when you came today, maybe you've never heard or understood the plan of salvation till today. Why not right now settle this between you and the Lord? You can say, God, I'm a sinner. We all are. 
But God, right here today, what I heard made sense, and I believe Jesus Christ was made to be sin for me so that I could be made his righteousness, that Christ took my sin and paid for them, was buried and rose again from the dead. And I trust him right now as my Savior, as my only hope of heaven. And if you do that, the moment you do that, God saves you. And you're saved eternally. Now, if you just prayed that prayer just now, God up in heaven knows and he saves you. If you're looking for a feeling, for confirmation, uh, we're never told to do that. Feelings are misleading. You have his word. Far better. God can't lie. He's not going to mislead you or deceive you. So if God said it and you believe it, that settles it. Right now, you can receive the gift of eternal life just by praying that prayer and telling God that you trust Jesus as your Savior. Lord, I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus died for me, paid my sin debt in full by his death and shed blood, was buried, and came back again from the dead. I trust Jesus now as my Savior, as my only hope of heaven, and the moment you do, God saves you. Would you do that? If you did it, I'd like to pray for you. I'm going to do this in such a way that you'll not be embarrassed. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. No one is looking, but I'm going to open my eyes now. And I'd like to include you in my closing prayer. And I'm going to do this in such a way you'll not be embarrassed. No one is looking except for me. And so while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you prayed this prayer, I'd like to have, if you wouldn't mind, you share that with me. And we'll do it in this way. I'll, have you ask, I'll just ask you to lift up your hand and put it back down to indicate that you trusted Christ as Savior right here this morning. And then I'll pray and we'll close the service here. But are there any right now that would say, I, I trusted Jesus Christ today as my Savior right here in this service. And I'd like you to know and I'd like you to pray for me. Would you slip up your hand where I can see it? God bless you, sir. Yes. Anybody else? I trusted Christ as my Savior right here this morning. Sometimes I don't catch your hand unless you lift it way high. But if you prayed that prayer and trusted Christ, lift it way up and put it right back down. And then we're going to close here. Christian, what about you? Maybe you never thought that God could use you or would even consider using you. But let me tell you, He can use you in a mighty way. There are people here with more talent than me and uh, can do much greater. And uh, you can use that to God's glory if you just dedicate your life to keep His Word and not deny His name. And uh, every one of us can be mightily used in our lives for Christ. And I pray that you would do that. Lord, we thank you for everybody here. We thank you for what you're doing through this church. We know, obviously, it's not because of uh, our abilities. We have all of us here uh, come together as a, a small body that wants to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And we're impacting the world. Uh, and, and people that come by marvel that we uh, appear to be stronger than we are. We appear to be uh, a large uh, body of believers here. But you're using a small group in a mighty way and we know that you get the glory and you get the praise because we truly know Lord that it's you that's opened these doors and provided these opportunities and given us the blessing of being a part of this so that we all share together as we uh, team up together to accomplish these things we ask you to uh, bless everyone who came today and especially this one that by the hand uh, said he trusted Christ we may not know there might have been others but I didn't see him but we pray that you'd give us a great we can continue to bless our church. In Jesus' name, amen.